And Charles just wanted to come and talk about, or just give a general musings on his latest views um, on the crypto space. Um, just before Charles starts, um, coinscrum.com has finally launched to the work from Tom and Louis. Um, there's, uh, we'll be populating it with more content over the coming weeks. Again, open forum, so uh, looking for people to write opinion pieces. Again, anything that uh, you feel you have to say, get in touch with us and you're welcome to take part. Uh, we'll also have it, we'll have a jobs board on there as well. So if you're, um, if you're founding a startup and you're looking for new employees or co-founders, then uh, you'll have a forum to post new jobs as well. Um, so again, uh, just go to www.coinscrum.com. Uh, I will now hand over to Charles Hoskinson. Okay, let's see here, testing one, two. What are we, we good, Tomer? All right, well, first thank you so much. First, thank you so much, Tomer and uh, Louie and Richard and everyone else at Coinscrum for uh, putting this on and see who's come out today. Oh, we have a good showing. Uh, I think, Ian, you here? All right, Mr. Grieg, that's British Satoshi. Okay, <laughs> it's true, he really is, read his work. Um, okay, so I'm Charles Hoskinson. I think a few people know me, um, in case you don't. I've been in the Bitcoin space for a little bit of time. I started with the Bitcoin Education Project. I didn't know anybody, and then I remembered an old axiom which said, those who do not know, teach. So I created the first MOOC in Bitcoin called Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Crypto. It was, I'm a big Peter Sellers fan, you know, Dr. Strangelove. And it ended up getting about 55,000 students. And I personally got about 5,000 emails, give or take, and I answered every single one of them. So it gave me a great opportunity to get to know everybody in the space and kind of get to know who was working on what. Um, from there, I said, boy, I should you know, do a cryptocurrency venture because cryptocurrency is really cool and exciting. And you know, I answered all these emails and I, uh, I probably should validate the time I've invested in this thing. So I asked around, what's interesting in the space? And this was around 2013. And so three things came up. One were value stable currencies. So as we all know, when you know, the price of Bitcoin goes up, or price of Bitcoin goes down, this is not so good for merchants. And this is not so good for people who want to hold it as a currency instead of a speculative instrument. Uh, the second was decentralized exchange. You know, what's the point of having this big magical decentralized system if all the cash in and cash out points are highly regulated and controlled and KYC'd? It's like we don't really get our revolution, right? And the third thing was to have kind of a programming language attached to a blockchain because it was super hard to actually write software. So I said, what's the easiest one to do? And it turned out to be a value stable currency. So I ended up partnering with Daniel Larimer and we created BitShares. In fact, we have one of the BitShares guys, or former BitShares guys. I, I'm a former BitShares guy too, right? Um, and that was a fun project. I went to Blacksburg, Virginia, and I had to fly into Roanoke, and they had, uh, I had a three-hour conversation with a pig farmer, and that was kind of like setting the tone for uh, how, uh, how much fun it was gonna be. Uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, so very briefly after that, I ended up meeting Vitalik Buterin and we started Ethereum, which is probably the venture that most people know me from. And uh, I had the privilege of working with five founders and eventually it became eight founders. And eventually it just became this humongous snowball -y decentralized movement with 50 meetup groups on five continents. And it's really just been absolutely remarkable to see how fast that group has, uh, has moved forward. So one presentation I'd love to do, but I've never done, now that you know who I am, is why cryptocurrencies matter. Why did I get interested in this space? I started as a mathematician and then I discovered women and how expensive they were, so I became a cryptographer because that paid more. But I had a nice job, so why the hell would I want to leave that nice job and actually go and travel all around the world and sleep on floors? And I have some great stories about Switzerland. You know, later on, we'll tell them. But uh, sleep on floors and so forth. Well, really, cryptocurrencies matter for, to me for three reasons. Uh, and I, I tend to group them in terms of the developed world, developing world, and kind of what it means for the international community in general. So in terms of the developed world, I'm not a person who wakes up every day and says the dollar is going to go away, or the pound is going to go away, or the euro is going to go away, or all these sovereign currencies are just going to die. We have trillions of dollars of financial infrastructure that's all floating around and it exists. What, one thing that's really curious, and it's not anything to do with Bitcoin that's happening, is we have these things called Apple Pay, and Samsung Pay, and Google Pay. You have all these payment services, right? And what are they doing? They're changing the POS systems. They're changing the way we transact with each other. Money is moving its way into the cell phone. So what I think cryptocurrency is going to do for the developed world is I think we're going to start tokenizing everything. We're going to tokenize gold, and we're going to tokenize silver, tokenize airline miles, and we're going to have a, you know, a portfolio of cryptocurrencies, energy futures. You can even kind of like do fractional tokenization of your land or something. 
And then what does that mean? Well, if you can tokenize all of it and move between it really quickly, can't you just put all that on your phone? And if the payment systems are really advanced, doesn't that mean that I can go to McDonald's or to Starbucks or to some place, and I have my airline miles, and I can pay for a hamburger? They get paid in pounds. I paid in airline miles. And there was all these little hops that happened and a decentralized exchange that happened between them. That's what I think is ultimately going to be kind of where the ecosystem moves, is this idea of liquefaction of value. Anything that has value, we can slap a token onto it, we can slap some rule onto it, we can have some sort of secure ledger that we can put that thing in, and then once we've done that, we can put it onto our cell phone, and we can move it, we're in control of it, and we can seamlessly move between these different tokens. And that's really cool, because now when you get your paycheck, you don't get paid in pounds. You can be paid in any composition of any asset you want. So we're moving beyond national currencies. And the cool thing is that these things are totally in your pocket, your control. Okay? You don't need a central third party to facilitate that transaction. It's all going to happen in these federated networks or decentralized networks, and to actually spend them as a public-private key pair. So that's where I really think the developing world is going to go, is just the next evolution. It's kind of a blending of existing payment services, an upgrading of the POS systems, and eventually a liquefaction of value, where everything just becomes a token and we throw it on in. And there's certainly a lot of discussions we can have about anonymity and privacy, and there's certainly going to be a lot of innovation and development there. We've already seen it with ring signatures and confidential transactions and the ZK snark people think with zero cash. And those are great academic discussions. But realistically, the, if we get anything out of this, being able to be in control of the composition of our wealth and be able to move very quickly between different forms, and in some cases very illiquid wealth, is super powerful. Okay, now where it gets super interesting to me is actually the developing world. Because what do we have there? Those three billion people who are unbanked, three billion people who have no real notion of property rights, three billion people who have a very hard time conducting themselves in e-commerce. Okay, and if you don't have a bank account, how do you move money digitally around? Okay, now we're talking. The other thing is their sovereign currencies aren't very good. Ever been to Zimbabwe? Or you know, ever talked to the Argentina people? Or you know, any of these countries that have had at some point in their recent history a currency crisis. So to me, those jurisdictions are the ones where we're probably going to see the best chance for Bitcoin adoption, the best chance for cryptocurrency adoption as an actual unit of account, as an actual currency. But here's the cool thing. It's no longer an either or where, okay, the developed world has all this really cool, amazing, magical stuff and the developing world is just going to have to wait. If it works on a cell phone as software, there is no cost to take that and hand it to somebody in Indonesia. And there's no cost to take that and to hand it to somebody in the Philippines. It's exactly the same. So that's where I see this movement happening, is we're going to get everything we get in the developed world, and we're going to give it to the guys in the developing world, but we're just going to use it differently, the people in the developing world. First, I think the core is identity. Right now, most people here have access to credit. And you have passports. You have driver's license. I have my passport right here. I always keep America with me. Okay? I have my passport on me. Well, I, I, I'm ID'd. But if you're in Afghanistan, or if you're in Syria, and you're a refugee, and you disappear, how do you identify yourself? How, how as a person, do you, do you say, I'm Charles Hoskinson, or I'm this person, here's my transaction history, here's my reputation? How do you know that guy's credible to give credit to? How do you know the level of risk there is in doing business with this person? If you're a bank or a financial institution, how the hell do you KYC that guy or AML that guy? Right? So, the core, I think, of the developing world is going to be the notion of a, a new form of identity. And then from there, we can start having a discussion about better currencies from the ones that they have in their jurisdictions. And then from there, this is where it gets really interesting. You can now bind property rights to the blockchain. You can do voting systems to the blockchain. You know, you can all of a sudden start talking about microcredit. Anybody want to guess how much microfinance loans are? Those are loans like 50 to $100 to people in poor countries. A shout out of guesses. How much? Anybody want to guess? What percentage? 30% higher. Yeah, between 35% to 85%, according to World Bank estimate. That's how much money somebody in Azerbaijan has to pay if they want to get a $100 loan to go start a small business. Could you imagine paying that? Now, if we build these decentralized financial systems and we have a beautiful identity system that allows us to know who that person is, guess what? Not only can we get money to them, we have tokens that can represent something that's value stable, perhaps even more stable than the dollar, we can have discussions about interest rates that are 5% or 10%. That's not a luxury, that's not a novelty, that's something that's going to change their lives. And it's something that's going to just make the world a better place. So I think the developing world is where you're going to see the most innovation. 
most innovation in terms of financing, most innovation in terms of new risk products, most innovation in terms of things like micro IPOs. You know, how do you get internet infrastructure? What about micro ISPs? These types of things. That's where we're going to have the magic in this movement. And that's for three billion people. Okay? All right, so now there's one other group I tend to think about, and these are the stodgy old folks, the bankers and the regulators and all these guys. And guess what? There's something for them too. It's pretty magical. It's not like this war where you know, we win and they lose. You know, if you think about a regulator, they worry about a lot of things. They worry about agency problems. They worry about systemic stability. You know, I live in America. We had some problems with 2008. Anybody remember that? Markets come down. You know, we're like, okay, what a day. So, well, what happened there? Well, what happened is you had a lack of transparency. A lot of people were doing business with people in ways that were hard to understand and know. And things were so interconnected, and we only discovered after the collapse. And this is generally what you see in these types of highly centralized systems. What if all these things become transparent? What if all these things live on a blockchain, or if these things live in some federated ledger? And instead of commerce being these little silos that don't talk to each other, now it's one big transaction graph. And you get some sort of index that a regulator can compute and say, this is too centralized, or this is too over leveraged, or there's too much risk living here. This is the notion of like a graph view of all commerce. It's never been possible before, but it is definitely possible. The other thing about regulation is, you know, in America we have libertarians, and they're over here, and nobody listens to them. They say, free market forever, yay, Ludwig von Mises and all these other guys. And then we have the socialists over here who are like, yay, oh, Soviet Union lost, what a shame. Okay, so we have this idea of regulate everything, or free market for everything, ignore market failures, and you know, all those things, let's not talk about that. But those are like an either or. But what if we had a third option? Everybody remember M.T. Gox? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, M.T. Gox. Okay, so you remember what it stood for? Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. Yeah. Some of the people are old enough to remember that in the Bitcoin space. Okay, so what happened there? Well, that was where this bloated Frenchman who likes his lattes decided to basically loot the house. So people deposited a lot of money and then money just disappeared. And everybody thought there was enough money on hand to pay the people. They were insolvent. What if we had a cryptographic proof of solvency? Now, remember when I said in the developed world that all of our tokens are going to be, you know, everything is going to be turned into token, whether it's your gold or your stocks or your bonds or your identity. Well, if you have them as a token, now you can do a cryptographic proof of solvency. So one thing that's going to be revolutionized from a regulatory perspective are financial institutions that have custodial risk. They hold assets. Guess what? You as the user of that institution don't have to trust the regulator. You don't have to trust the free market reputation. You get cryptographic proof. And when you start thinking this way, you start taking a step back and saying, whoa, there's all kinds of relationships. There's all kinds of systems that I can get myself involved in and look at where I don't want to trust the regulator. I don't want to trust the free market. I just want to trust the math. You see, and this is where the notion of smart contracts come into play. It's terms and conditions on your money. You don't send just a blind transaction from Alice to Bob. You can attach all these rules and conditions and other things and triggers. And you now get absolute certainty as long as the network itself is not compromised. And as these things grow to scale, that becomes mathematically improbable that it's going to behave the way that you intended. So this is where I really see the regulatory scheme moving, is that all these things where we just thought previously you just have to audit and have these expensive policies and other things, now we can just move to an algorithmic basis for regulation. That's a really powerful thing. The final thing I'll mention is, you know, after 2008, all the central banks got together and they said, you know, the United States, we love them, they're a great, wonderful country, but they probably shouldn't be the world reserve currency anymore. They, they kind of screwed up, and they've screwed up too many times. And everybody said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then they said, what the hell are we going to replace it with? The euro? No, they've been pretty naughty too. And the Chinese? Oh, no, we can't do those guys. What about the ruble? Nah. Okay. And that's where the conversation goes, right? You're stuck. You can't get off the dollar, right? What if instead you could create a federated international reserve currency that was a composition of many different assets built in a way that was value neutral? So this is not a new idea, it's an old idea, most good ideas are. Benjamin Graham, if anybody reads The Value Investor, The Intelligent Investor, the book that Warren Buffett read to make all his money, he's actually a student of Benjamin Graham. Uh, he said, wow, it'd be really cool to build a basket currency, a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, a little bit of national currencies, and all these things select in a way that when some go up, some go down, so overall you have kind of a neutral value. Well, if you could do this, and you could federate this amongst the central banks, now you have basically an international reserve currency that no one can tamper with 
and it's built in a way that you could use for trade finance. If you're Exxon Mobil and you do a $50 billion deal in Brazil and you know, offshore oil or something like that, uh, you, instead of pricing US dollars, you can now price it in this new token. See, these are the kinds of possibilities that really excite the central banks and really excite regulators in that they either get to understand systemic risk better, they get completely new options for international business that are more meaningful, or in some cases they get to explore monetary policy that was politically impossible to explore in uh, today's environment. So that's basically why cryptocurrencies are meaningful to me. This is why I kind of left the cushy crypto job and, and decided to go fly around the world and sleep on floors. So I promised to, and in closing, I'll tell you this story to tell the story about Switzerland. <laughs> okay, so Richard Stott, he's in the audience with me. Now it's Richard Wilde. Congratulations, Richard. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so Richard, R R Richard and I, uh, w we were on Ethereum together, and we had this beautiful home with about 10 other people in Myers Koppel. And Myers Koppel is this like idyllic Heidi, like uh, Swiss place. You know, every day you walk, and there's the fog cowling through, and I had my coffee, and I'm like, yay, the cows have bells. Okay, so it was a beautiful, beautiful place to, to live. And anyway, the, 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 the uh, guy who's renting us the house, he said, oh, no, you, you have to leave, and, but I can, you can come back in two weeks, but you have to leave. So we were homeless, 10 of us. We said, God, where are we going to stay? And at the time, we were working with a Swiss fellow named Herbert Sturchi. He's a very short guy. And he said, don't worry, Charles. You come stay with me. It'll be great in Luzern. And I said, oh, beautiful. So all 10 of us show up. We go up the elevator, come to his apartment. It's a one-bedroom apartment for 10 of us. <laughs> and we were like, OK, Herbert. So I ended up sleeping in the closet. And every morning at 5.30, Herbert would knock on the closet. And he says, Charles, it's time to come out of the closet. You're going to love it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> And the first few times it was very funny, and about two weeks into it, um, I really had to remember those three reasons why I was in the cryptocurrency space. Um, anyway, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you all get semi-inebriated. It, uh, it's a beautiful bar, great bartender. Thank you. Uh, questions, thank you. I assume you have some. Yes, uh, questions, anyone have questions? Just wondering, uh, you mentioned about basket. Uh, case currencies. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Barbados talking about using Bitcoin, possibly putting that into their basket. What do you think of Bitcoin as some going into the basket? Yeah, actually, it's a great idea. I mean, uh, it, it's relative to its market capitalization, it's an incredibly low risk to buy a small quantity of Bitcoin and put it into your currency basket. Um, yeah, there's some great people down in Barbados, by the way. Gabriel Bev and Oliver Gale, they run an exchange called uh, Bit. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good entity. But uh, in terms of basket currencies in general, again, it's not a, it's not a new idea. It's been around for a while. And I think there's a, uh, not, it's not a cryptocurrency, but it's like Venn, the hub culture. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and so I encourage you to start there and kind of work your way around. Uh, as for uh, central banks having it as a reserve, I mean, it's one of those things where for the price of a Lamborghini, you can get a pretty decent reserve as a central bank. And, you know, if Bitcoin becomes big, yeah, you actually made a good ROI on it. Next question. Come on, guys. All right. So I've been uh, listening a lot to the um, concept of prediction markets. And I would be interested in your thoughts on how the prediction marketplace can interface with the Bitcoin space. Because they were invented very separately and they were never invented to be together. But what possibilities do you say, see from them combining? Okay. So you need some primitives for prediction markets to work. So there's two projects or two good schools of thought on cryptocurrency-related uh, prediction markets. One comes from Princeton University, and they have this beautiful paper that they wrote. And then the other is kind of the Augur truth coin you know, area. But in general, you have this idea of deterministic and non-deterministic deterministic and non-deterministic smart contracts. So deterministic smart contracts are where you have a smart contract where everything in the network uh, is sufficient to give you your output. Okay, so for example, a lottery based on something that's going on in the, uh, in the system. But a non-deterministic one is where you need an oracle, an outside feed, okay? Like for example, Bitcoin can't know its own price. This is something that's very difficult, actually impossible for Bitcoin to know. You need an oracle to pipe that in. So all prediction markets actually do require this. Um, and, there are, and I would encourage you to look at Ethereum and look at the Augur project because it's a very good starting point uh, if you're interested. Now, in terms of use cases, what could you do with these things? Well, one really cool use case for the insurance industry is, everybody ever, anybody ever been to the Louvre? Oh, yeah, of course, you're an artist. Okay. Now, you know, it, there's probably some priceless paintings in there, you would say, but if you're insuring those paintings, how much are they actually worth? 
how much is the Mona Lisa worth? It's one, and they're not going to sell it. But yet, if the Louvre burns down or you know some bad event happens, they might actually have to recover those losses. So prediction markets could be used to price uh, priceless assets. Uh, they also could be used to predict events. Uh, Hollywood Stock Exchange is kind of the canonical example, where you know, like, who's going to win the Oscar? How much money is uh, you know some market going to make? And Intrade had a great time uh, predicting elections, like who's going to win the American election and so forth. So what I really see prediction markets, the intersection between cryptocurrencies and the space uh, having, is there's still probably going to be this notion of a uh, of a service provider who's hosting it, like an in-trade. Rather, you just get a little bit more trustless with, uh, with these things, or you get a payment system with these things. So you can kind of disintermediate a bit. And there might even be a federated service. So it's, it's an active area, and just start with Princeton and Augur and kind of work your way around. And it's, it's usually contextual to the application. Does that make sense? OK. Yes. The legendary Michael Parsons. Legendary Michael Parsons, yeah. Th this man uh, once started a bank, actually. In, in Dubai, yes. Yeah, it was a beautiful and bank, too. I introduced the entire banking system to Russia as well, yeah. on my own. That's, that's true. And so he, he, <laughs> that's true, yeah. he, he, So, so <laughs> he's the guy to blame. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, uh, there's a big debate between whether we should have private blockchains or public blockchains, and you've got people like John Matonis and Jeff Garzik who are in favor of public blockchains, i.e. the Bitcoin blockchain, and you've got R3 who are doing a consortium and doing their own private blockchain. We yeah, there's no one from R3 we, here, we, we by think the way. No one, no, one from R3, no one from R3. Ian Gregg's not from R3. He's not, he's not here. Ian Gregg doesn't exist. He's just a, a figment of our imagination. <laughs> he's not here. So what's the view? Is there, a, is there, a, is there, a, is there a, a possible solution to discuss between public and private blockchains? And I've got this bottle of beer here, and it says Budweiser... Budvar, it's got B, I've seen it, B dot original, which is Bitcoin, so should we be going to the B dot original, Bitcoin, or should we be going to a private blockchain, or should we be going to something else, something <laughs> else, a loaded question, something else. That, I rest my case there. Uh, All right, let's just give Michael a round of applause. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> So I think if I wave my arms enough with this answer, it'll make sense. Um, <laughs> okay, so you have this idea of private and public. So one of the problems with banking applications or any applications that involve people is not everything we'd probably like to be public, right? Maybe not our entire financial history. Would everybody like their credit card bill to be public? Would everybody like all their internet search history to be public, right? So blockchains are wonderful for things where you do require transparency, um, accounting systems, uh, supply chain management, financial systems, these types of things, property transfer systems like land registry, if you, you know, get your deed and move it around or you know, register fine art. But, oh no, no, he's, he's listening. He's, he's giving you an answer. He he's answering your question. No, 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 he, 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 he's listening. Michael has ears in the back of his head. I might know the answer. We're actually quite good friends. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, so, like so, 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 so anyway, uh, I think the interplay comes down to, it again goes to, it's, it's application specific. Uh, and what's probably going to end up happening is where you see private blockchains being used or in federations of uh, industries. Like if all the banks want to get together and say, you know, Swiss and Fix, we need to get rid of that and go to something else, they'll probably have a, a mutually distributed ledger that's private between them. And then what you can do is check on the uh, Bitcoin blockchain or any other public ledger where you can take weekly snapshots or monthly snapshots or something like that and you know the ledger is right up to a certain point, the checkpoint matches. So that's probably where the interplay is going to come from. Um, as for other solutions, well, you really do need better pegging mechanisms. So sidechains is one project where you can move value between different blockchains um, and then chains have to know each other and be able to talk to each other. So there do need to be some standards for the internet of blockchains. The, you know, if I have chain alpha, chain beta, chain gamma and so forth, the, I know for a fact I can trustlessly move value between these different systems and I'm only relying on the trust of the consensus algorithm. But uh, it's an open area of research. There's certainly a lot of wonderful people that are thinking about it, of wonderful projects that are thinking about it that are quite well funded, some in industry and some in academia. Just to give you a sampling, Blockstream has about 28 or so million or something like that. Uh, and they have wonderful investors and they're building a, a BIP right now, which should be out in the next three months for just moving value between 
chains. Uh, our IC3 has a $3 million NSF grant. Uh, that's a joint collaboration between University of Maryland and Cornell University. And they're just systematically working their way through these problems, writing white paper after white paper, saying this is probably a solution, or at the very least, a parameterized trade-off. Or if you try to do particular things, you know what you're giving up, which is the most important thing in the system. As for how this is going to change things, it probably goes back down to what I was talking about earlier with the developing world, developed world, and uh, regulated world paradigms, where to get to those things I described, you need these foundations. And you need to be, have the ability to be private when you want and public when you want. Uh, and that's the, probably the most abstract and non-answer I can give you to your magical question, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Yes. Abstract, magical, non-answer. Jazz hands. Well, Darkcoin and Zero Cash are different projects. Yeah, and Darkcoin is now Dash. Um, so, you know, there's Monero, Darkcoin, Zero Cash. There's kind of this mixed coin proposal out of Princeton. There's a lot of different ways that one can look. And it depends on, okay, so in terms of anonymity, you have two properties. You have pseudonymity and linkability, right? And then you also, that's the anonymity of the individual, but then there's also the idea of, well, the amount of money flowing in the transaction. Uh, so, for example, if I'm able to distinguish between transaction alpha and beta in terms of value, that might be more meaningful than knowing the actors I'm sending it between. For example, you know, there's a billion dollar transaction versus a five dollar transaction. If I'm going to zero in all my resources on finding out uh, things, I would like to know the billion versus the five. And there's some technology to obfuscate that as well. Uh, they're great. Uh, they do require cryptographic primitives. Like with zero cash, you need ZK snarks. And those are like zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge. It's uh, crypto magic. It lives in the moon. The Israelis are really good at it. And uh, they've written a lot of wonderful papers about it. And uh, there's a great project actually out of Johns Hopkins that Dr. Green is working on. And they're going to be launching a side-chained currency uh, to Bitcoin uh, probably next year that implements zero cash. Uh, there's still some open questions about what is the overall level of security and what is the overall possibility to link. Um, and that's an uh, that's, uh, open area of research. I think they're good, they're wonderful, and uh, they have a place and a purpose. And actually in the banking community, uh, it goes back down to privacy. Not everybody's really comfortable with transaction amounts being known, moving between Alice and Bob, or being linkable between Alice and Bob. Sometimes, even in a KYC to AML setting, you would like to have some degree of confidentiality and, and uh, lack of transparency in that amount. But you still want a cryptographic guarantee that double spending has not happened. Okay. Ah, what? Yeah, thank ah. you very much. Uh, actually, my question is following, actually, the uh, Ethereum has a plan to switch from proof of work to proof of stake eventually. Uh, but <laughs> in the same time, let's say, uh, Bitcoin has a uh, cap value several billion dollars, right? And if I the whole value kept in uh, Ethereum is not very big, it means that probably anybody with the money can come and put his stake uh, or have a lot of... Uh, uh, N nodes uh, colluding together, right? So how it can be avoided, actually? Okay, so... Probably the, I, I, yeah, so it's a good question. And this is a philosophical question about the nature of proof of stake in general. So it's kind of a rule by plutocracy. The wealthy people tend to be able to make the vote. That's the proof of stake model. Um, so... I'm not involved with the Ethereum project anymore. I haven't been since June, so I don't speak on their behalf. So in public settings, I always try to make that clear because if I say something, they say, oh, Charles said something. And I'm like, well, I'm not there anymore. Talk to Ming. Um, but in, and actually, the guy who is building their consensus algorithm, his name is Vlad, and he's working on a consensus algorithm called Casper, which is kind of like a bonded proof-of-stake system. But your question was more, how do you make these systems secure when a well-capitalized actor can enter your system, buy up a bunch of coins, and then you know, conduct some havoc? So this is basically what's classified as a Goldfinger attack. Has anybody seen James Bond, Goldfinger, uh, uh, Radiate the Gold? Uh, and so what, what, that's an attack where an external actor, for some bizarre reason, wants to destroy your currency. Now, it's not an economically rational attack for the value of the currency itself. Because if you go into Ethereum, for example, and buy up a lot of the currency, first you're going to drive the price way up. Because you know, just because you have a market cap doesn't mean you have that much liquidity. And as you start buying, the price goes way, way up, right? Okay, but then after you've done that, if you destroy the currency, the value goes way, 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 way down, so you don't really get a good ROI out of that proposition, unless you have some external you know, desire. Like, for example, like you're an evil guy who wants to destroy Ethereum, or you have like, you know, options or something to short sell the network. 
And that potentially is possible. That's one of the attack vectors for a proof of stake system. But then let's look at proof of work. How much money would one have to pay to buy a sufficient amount of ASIC hardware very silently to get 51%? Or perhaps to just bribe four or five mining pools to go ahead and behave in a particular way for a particular domain of time? And is that comparable with purchasing 51% of the currency to attack the currency? It's an economic question, and I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. We probably could try. Next question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question that can be answered by anyone, so please have a go of it. Because oh, I, lo I love these questions. Because <laughs> I've been pondering it for quite a little time. Um, we all talk about and we think about the three billion unbanked. Um, we don't often consider the fact that they're not just unbanked, but they don't have too much of an understanding of how money works because they live in a sort of fairly limited cash society and their access, as you know, you know to any kind of economic benefit is very limited. So what we're talking about is an incredibly sophisticated financial solution which we get, see, and can look at them and say, this is going to solve everything for you. And yet from the early stages of this uh, concept being sort of got by the people in this part of the world, mm -hmm. it's very slow. The take-up is, is probably... I, I have no way of even measuring what the take-up is, and I know that there are people working on solutions which they feel will work. But crossing that paradigm, getting these people, uh, in the three billion unbanked, even a proportion of them, a tiny proportion of them, to actually accept, understand, have solutions that work for them, practical terms in the real world, uh, what's the catalyst, where's the catalyst, how can it work, as I say, coming from where they are with very little understanding mm -hmm. of what this whole uh, new paradigm means. Um, is that a question? I don't uh, know. That's a fair question. That's actually <laughs> a very a question? fair question. Well, because, you know, I mentioned the developing yeah. world, and I think it's going to do all this magic, so yeah. I have to say how. Mm. Okay, so first off, we have this thing. It's called a cell phone, and when this gets old, I give it to Africa and South America. It'll end up there. Okay, most of them do. And we recycle our phones every two, three years or something like that. So infrastructure is getting far better. They're getting 4G. So there are internet on and off ramps. And there are computing devices that are now uh, sufficiently powerful to do most of the things, if not all of the things, that one would want to do. And within five years, this will be nearly ubiquitous. So you need infrastructure. And that's the foundational infrastructure for it. Then there's kind of the mental notion. The good news is the developing world is actually ahead of us in terms of the developed world. Why? Because their local currencies suck. They're already used to dealing with currencies that collapse or massively inflate. In fact, in Zimbabwe, when they were going through hyperinflation, people wanted to be paid in the morning because their money was worth like 10% or 20% less at the end of the day. Could you imagine living in that kind of an environment? So what does it mean? You build alternative money. In fact, in Kenya, they use M-Pesa, which is cell phone minutes, right? It's, so they're already used to the notion of you know, alternative money and in some cases, digital money. So th that conception is there. And it's not going to come where somebody says, hey, I'm a white guy for some different country, and I'm going to give you this magic solution. Here you go. What it's going to happen is they're going to have a game, or they're going to have some service that is localized to them, which just so happens to carry a cryptocurrency stack with it, and all the infrastructure, a wallet, and these things. And once they have that stack, then people are going to build on top of it very organically. And just like the way Bitcoin got bootstrapped and Ethereum got bootstrapped and any of these good systems that just seem to appear out of nowhere got bootstrapped, it'll grow that way and people will start using it to conduct commerce. Not because somebody pays them to, but because A, it's economically more efficient or it gives them the ability to do something they weren't previously able to do. Uh, and the catalyst, I think, to do this has already occurred. We needed the miracle of the internet and we needed the miracle of cell phones and mobile computing and to get enough robustness, local processing power in their hands. Uh, so this is, a, this is my best answer I can give to your question. Uh, as for what particular secret sauce a person could have, that's, a, that's an investor question, and I have my ideas, and some are under NDA, and other people have their own ideas. Uh, but uh, it'll be fun to see what happens, and somebody will get it right, just like somebody got the operating system right, and just like somebody got the mobile computing model right. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. I'm like, does anybody know what's, where PayPal started? It wasn't a payment service. There were cryptographic tokens on Palm Pilot, and it was a company called Confinity, and they created a website to kind of buy and sell the tokens, and everybody used the website, but nobody wanted to use the Palm Pilot stuff. And they said, shit, we need a new business model, right? So sometimes when you're a really bright guy and you have some idea, it's sometimes you find a different idea, and it's more meaningful. 
And so this is probably what's going to happen in terms of the developing world. And it's probably not going to happen from anybody here. It's going to happen from them and their ability to spread it amongst each other. Is that a good? Okay. Best non-answer I can give to your unanswerable query. Jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to steal the mic. Brilliant. Good. Um, col colored coins versus custom blockchains, and I guess part of the answer might have to do with the Goldfinger attack you already talked about, but right. maybe you have a longer, and I guess your answer would be uh, Ethereum, but no, those two. <laughs> I, I'm not Vitalik. Um, okay, color coins versus custom blockchains. Well, they do different things. Um, so there are some protocols like open assets, and I think Peter Todd's been pumping, was it proof chains or something like that? Yeah, the big issue is SPV. Can you do SPV with it? And currently, the color coin protocols do not allow you to do that um, without trusting a trusted bootstrap. So uh, assuming that will one day be resolved, and it probably will because people will change the scripting language and you know, change the data structures to permit it, uh, it will be an option and people will do it. But I, I, I take a step back and I ask myself, guys, maximalists, what the hell do we have one of? I mean, do we have one language? Do we have one country? Even the religions that say there's only one God, we can't even agree on that one God, right? So how are we gonna just have one universal currency or one standard? I, I've been in technology long enough that when somebody comes to me and says my standard or my tech is the universal standard, it, even with Windows, I mean like 90% market share and then you know Android comes around. There's more Android devices than Windows devices. So I, I think it's rather a Pyrrhic victory to focus on trying to make one blockchain to rule them all. Because even if you have that, you have a screwed up monetary distribution. It is, you're going to go to India and say, billion guys, it's great, it's a new system, it's Bitcoin, and oh, by the way, the rich white people own 70% of it already, and so uh, <laughs> you guys get the other 30%, figure it out, and you got to buy it at a much higher price. You think they're going to be like, yeah, that sounds cool, let's go do that. No, they're going to create their own, and it, what matters more to me is the flow of value between those chains and those tokens. Now, whether those tokens are color coins based on Bitcoin or are completely new blockchains or you know, some other paradigm with directed acyclic graphs that's magical and comes out of some weird guy's brain, I have no clue. Uh, and I just think it's, if you want to be safe, it's safe to probably bet on a multi-standard system and focus on the movement of information and value in a trustless way as Blockstream and others are doing. That kind of answer your question? Almost. <laughs> uh, you mentioned religion, actually, probably to bring a little bit of holy war here. What do you think about uh, how to approach the problem of uh, uh, limited uh, size of block in Bitcoin and how to deal with it? So you have two parameters, block size and block interval. Uh, so how rapidly do you produce the block sets interval and how big are the block sets block size? So there's several proposals that are on the table that are good. And I look at the proposals that come out of academia, not these scaling Bitcoin conferences, because you know, I'm kind of biased. I don't get invited to them. You know, I'm not special. Um, but uh, Bitcoin NG is actually a really good idea, and I think it has some merit. And so succinctly, what it does is instead of having mi mining, it still occurs every 10 minutes, but what you do is you use the blocks that are produced every 10 minutes as elections for a leader or leader set, and then they have micro blocks that they can generate at parameters that are based on the diameter of the network as well as the, uh, uh, the overall bandwidth of the network. And I encourage you to read the paper. It's a very good paper. So those types of paradigms look good to me. The other thing is how much can we realistically move out of the blockchains and do through federated services? Like this is a lightning concept, right? Can we get stuff off chain, do a bunch of stuff, and then it reconciles eventually in a compressed form like a hash or some magic moon math cryptography? And I think we'll see more of that. Um, but ultimately, the long-term solution is blockchain sharding. We already have sharding in databases. You know, you have some pool of data here, and then you chop it up to slices, and then you live in cap theorem land. You know, it, 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 can you get consistency? Is it available? Is there persistence? And you pick two, and good luck, right? So we're going to move in that direction at some point. There's already some papers and ideas and research. Some come from graph databases. Some come from other notions that people are exploring. And uh, I think uh, over the next five or 10 years, somebody's just gonna come up with something that's quite compelling and that will become the standard, Bitcoin will adopt it, and then we're no longer even talking about block size. 
because now we're talking about like this multi petabyte mesh of data and everybody has a 50 or 100 megabyte slice of it and it's just put together like a jigsaw in just the right way maybe some erasure codes another thing are in there and then it just ends up being you know what it is and if you can't quite get your data because the nodes that have it are down you if it ever they ever come back online you'll have some fidelity ledger that has hashes that's probably the long term uh, solution um, and you have to think about scalability in more than just data. There's also computation and network bandwidth you have to think about. You know, how many compu computational resources are required? Bitcoin people don't think about that much. The Ethereum people do, because we have smart contracts that live on the blockchain, and they're very heavy to validate. And as these programs get larger, that becomes a concern. And the model of, you know, every line of code has to be, you know, read by everybody and run by everybody, that's not going to scale. So you need to have different solutions as well. And then bandwidth is the same way. You know, the developing world, they don't live on fat pipes. They don't have their fiber optic connection, OC192, and they're beaming in gigabits of data. You know, you have 3G. So no, 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 20 megabyte or 100 megabyte block size is not going to work. So improvement of SPV, uh, improvement of off-chain services, blockchain sharding, and then different paradigms about how data is going to reconcile throughout the network are probably going to be the long-term scalability solution. And they're much, much more effective than Gavin and Drazen and Mike getting into a pissy fight about, you know, block being 10 megabytes or something like that. I, I, just don't see, I just don't see anything productive coming out of that conversation. You know, the other thing that pisses me off about this conversation, it's always pissed me off. Why couldn't these guys just all get in a room and sit down and say, what are the parameters we really care about here? You know, what are the things we really care about here? You know, what, what are the options on the table? And just have a debate and solve the damn thing. There's been several crises that have happened in Bitcoin, some as early as 2009, and people got in a room and solved the problems. And this fight is just extraordinary to me, where everybody just got in their own little camps and threw hand grenades at each other, and they went to Reddit, and people got banned, and all these things happened. And now Mike is like arch enemy number one. You know, Mike Hearn was in Bitcoin since May of 2009. Satoshi released the blockchain January 3rd of 2009. First transaction happened January 12th. It was block 170. You know, to, to Hal Finney. You know, and four months later, this guy's in the ecosystem. He's one of the first guys. And for people to love hand grenades at him, say he's a horrible person and he's the enemy. You know, it just shows you how you don't get things done. And I think, if anything, the block size debate revealed that we have a governance problem in Bitcoin. That's the big issue. And we should take a step back and say, fuck the block size. Let's worry about governance first and figure out how moving forward we're actually going to make decisions. You have a question? Oh. Yeah, mic uh, microphone first. Right, we'll, we'll pass it back. So I can that, feel your context, anger. Wouldn't it be good to say, regardless of my opinion about the block size, sure. um, it, wouldn't it be good if you had like dozens of forks that are really incompatible and just have this mess, but then figure out how to have you know, a viable blockchain and consensus despite incompatible versions of wallets running, right. rather than trying to get this consensus by a meeting, which, you know, leads to high school drama, yada, yada. Right. Just have a very robust system where people can have different opinions and whoever convinces the most winers, miners uh, wins. Right. So that would be like a DAG structure. It'd uh, be a painful transition, though. Yeah. yeah. And so can you do soft forks and, you know, or can you do forks in a way that are productive and don't just value of the overall network you know, or can you look at data structures that do permit this and let people make a decision of what chain they want to support that's certainly a proposal and some people have had that discussion and I honestly guys I think realistically we're gonna start moving in those types of directions because you cannot get ubiquitous consensus in any place okay everybody is gonna have a different opinion that's why we have a thousand altcoins you know not all of them are pump and dump some are actually legitimate differences of opinion about technology and, uh, and Bitcoin itself is starting to get to the point and to the size where there's going to be legitimate differences of opinion and forks are going to occur. Uh, and we probably as a community need to do a better job about addressing what the world looks like post fork. So I think it's, uh, you bring up a fair point and I'm, I actually agree with you. So I, I, I wanted to... Uh, Sorry, <laughs> sit down. Uh, you know, Belgium people. Yeah, the, the you're really good for making block ciphers. The lazy Belgian. Uh, yeah, and we are we are in alert number four now in Brussels. I don't know whether you saw that, but uh, what was that alert number four? Really? It's like the war hmm? in Brussels. Do you see that? No. Okay. No? okay you have okay. to you have to you have to have a look. Uh, my question, besides uh, value and currency, is about the other use cases of blockchains. Do you think that centralized uh, companies like Facebook or Uber should be afraid of uh, the natural evolution that we're all dreaming of, so a decentralized organization where everyone would be in charge of their own data, where 
there wouldn't be like uh, data centers uh, owned by uh, a Menlo Park company holding all the data. Do, do you think that it's natural, or do you think that from a user perspective, it's so good what Uber and uh, and and Facebook are providing that actually you need more than just natural evolution to to right. It's a good that. question, and you know what will the world's future businesses look like now that we have this new paradigm? Um, it reminds me of kind of like the invention of color movies or the invention of 3D movies, and we have this new dimension of thinking, and then you know people create these color movies that are horribly oversaturated. And you puke, or you know you see a 3D movie and it comes at you. Anytime you get new tools that allow you to express yourself or have people interact in a new way, uh, everybody says, "Oh, these new tools are going to kill all the old paradigms." And in some cases, like the horse and buggy, it does work. In other cases, it just kind of naturally works its way into society and doesn't quite kill everything. Like, for example, we have Skype. that didn't kill the cell phone companies. They're in the telecom companies are still around. The cell phones didn't kill Verizon, right? So the question is, are, are we looking more like what VoIP did to phones or more like what cars did to horses? Um, the industries, I would say, that are most vulnerable to this kind of disruption are industries like remittance businesses, for example, where they have this wonderful little you know, cabal that they've assembled over the last hundred or so years where they sit between people and they add a humongous fee and they built this beautiful business structure around it. And then all of a sudden you go from 8.5% to 15% for remittances down to less than 1% for remittances. I think that's a huge thing that's going to happen. Now, another thing like Facebook, they have a billion users. Where the billion users come together over a decentralized network. I want to switch out the mic. Whether these billion users want to, uh, to come together over a decentralized backend or they come together over a backend with a Facebook branding, you know, it's hard to say. And the monetization is for services. There's still going to be a market for micro-targeting and there's still going to be a market for connecting people and getting them to buy things. So, you know, the people who will win are the people who change their business models ever so slightly. But I don't think that we're going to see banks go away or Facebook go away or LinkedIn go away. I just think the stacks that they run on, the technology that they run on, these things will just normally, you know, organically evolve over. And uh, they probably will actually be more disruptive to the banks than they will be uh, to their users. And, uh, you know, like Facebook has Messenger, and if you can move money through it, now you have a money system for a billion people. It scares the hell out of Chase. <laughs> you know, it scares the hell out of the banks. It's not, it's, they're, Facebook's not worried about Bitcoin. It helps their business model. Um, whereas guys like Western Union, I would say, are, are terrified of these types of things because you know their whole model dies. Um, you know, the other thing is, uh, what will it do to industries that have monopolies or industries that are highly regulated that don't necessarily need to look like that? And I think those are industries that are keen to be disrupted or flooded away as well. Yeah, U Uber is a great example of what you what happened when you had a highly regulated, highly controlled market like in New York. You have taxi medallions. Well, not really. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the first entrant into the market, but then many more people will come in and then there'll be competition. And then what will happen is that over time, these services will become more federated or decentralized. I mean, like Microsoft was a monopoly right now. And Microsoft was $600 billion in market cap. They were so powerful, they could crush anybody. Look what they did to Netscape. And now they're, they're irrelevant in the operating system. Pardon? Yeah, but the Uber drivers own their own business. They're private contractors. They have their own business. They set their own hours. They get their own pay. Okay. Okay. So Uber. Uber saves me money, and it saves me money over an existing service that I have as a consumer. And yeah. Yeah. 
you know, that's the VCs and the investors who have done that. And, I, I, and I'm going to tell you, somebody is going to write a book called The Calling of the Unicorns at some point. Because <laughs> to be honest with you, there's a lot of overvaluation right now with a lot of these ventures. And there's insane business models. Like, you know, we saw it with first.com boom, with pets.com and other things. It's just we have a much larger version of it going on right now. And as for businesses like Uber, okay, they might build a sustainable temporary business model, but these are perturbable. And changes will happen, and I'm inclined to agree that you know a, a, a cheaper alternative will come around, and probably if it's a better alternative and it provides the same services, uh, Uber will die, or they'll have to change and evolve. Yes, they are. In fact, in terms of. Right. Right. And, and actually, in terms of innovation, they, th these guys walked into Carnegie Mellon University and got the whole machine vision department. They just scooped up all these guys and brought them in. So they're great companies and they do great innovation. Are they perfect companies? No. Uh, but they make the world a better place and they, they open up more opportunities for more people. There's a lot of people who are Uber drivers who, uh, you know, that's a great part-time job for them. Similarly, eBay. I mean, if, let's say you were a guy who liked teacups and this was a great hobby business. Now, if you were in like some small town like Manhattan, Kansas, the, how the hell would you sell teacups and actually make any money off of that? But now you can do it on eBay, right? And so this is what happens when you have these decentralized, multi-sided markets. And the market provider, right now, they're monopolized and centralized, but I'm inclined to agree that those market providers will either federate or they'll change over. Or what will happen is people just deploy Uber on areas where there's already people, like Facebook. Like, what if Facebook created an application where you could do Uber through Facebook using a blockchain and the payment systems there? They have a billion fucking people. What the hell does Uber have? Yeah, so, so, so competition eats your lunch, and it doesn't matter if you have a monopoly. We're in a post-monopoly world. It's not uh, Rockefeller and Vanderbilt and these guys anymore. It's, uh, things move very quickly, uh, and things get broken up very quickly, at least from what I've seen the last 25 years. Sure. Give me a I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to ask a question, and the question is this. I would like someone else to ask a question, not me. As you always expect something different from me, I'm doing it. The person I'd like to ask the question is Mr. Ian Grigg. So would you ask a question, Ian? You should see Michael actually after the third drink. It's... Oh, it, it, we're going to be here all night. I, I would like to ask a question. Okay, okay. But can I have a rain check? Sure. Thank you. That was the easiest question of the night. It was great. Okay, so I've asked for some open mic time, and if you're finished and everybody else is finished, I can dive in and have that time. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, any, uh, unless anybody. Super. <laughs> crypto rap battles, ladies and gentlemen. Crypto rap battles. We need a gong. That's what we, we're going to get a gong next time. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Thanks, Charles. I'll give it back to you later. So, Thank uh, you, Charles. And uh, over, seamlessly over to Mr. Ian Grigg. So I had a small announcement to make, um, but thinking about it, I, didn't, I, I kind of figured out that nobody would know what I'm talking about. So I've got to go back into history and explain a few things, and it's a bit long and tedious, and I'll come back to Charles and you know, dump him a question, just to help. Um, so it, it goes back to World War II. <laughs> a young chap called Alan Turing mucked around with computers. In fact, he invented the computer, practically speaking. Uh, actually, you go back 100 years, there was a girl called Ada Lovelace who wrote the first program, and Charles Babbage, who invented it on paper. But Alan Turing was the man who's credited with basically inventing enough of the modeling and the concept and how you turn it into mathematics and so forth and so on. And meanwhile, he helped build one and you know won World War II single-handedly and all that sort of stuff, which was all very good. But it's important for two reasons. One of which is he created a model called the Turing machine, or what we call the Turing, the Turing machine. And uh, this model was so fundamental and so basic, it is used in computer science to solve a hell of a lot of stuff. 
At this point, I run out of competence. So my question to Charles is, can you tell us why the Turing computer is so important? So why Turing completeness is so important? Yes. OK. He's Morgan. <laughs> OK. <laughs> no, I, I know what Turing completeness is. I mean, there's the Enchai Dung's problem. And you know, Alonso, it, to be fair, Alonzo Church he was also involved in that as well. Absolutely. All right. It's my story, and I'm cutting him out. OK. Um, OK, so if one is to create a formal language where you say, OK, these are the instructions in my formal language. You have language A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you can just go down the list, right? It would be super nice if you had a universal system that if you were in just the right way to compile that language into a base language, all these things would evaluate the same way, like Turing completeness, right? Uh, so to tell you the truth, I don't spend a lot of time, even though I say Turing complete, Turing complete, Turing complete, is thinking about things. I don't, Ian. I'm so sorry. But get off. <laughs> get off. Get off. <laughs> but so. Um, but but no no no. To be fair. Okay. To, to, to be fair. Okay. To be fair, it's just all about the practical answer I can give people is it's just all about being able to start somewhere, uh, whatever language you want, and if you follow certain rules, know that it's going to work uh, universally throughout the system. That's the best answer I can give, and I, I really don't want to get into it, to be honest with you. It's difficult. This is, this is the problem I had. So, <laughs> to us mere mortals, it becomes very important when you're thinking about Bitcoin and its script language and so forth. There's this right. little thing called smart contracts. Invented by Nick Zebo, who was here a couple of weeks ago doing his talk. Um, and the notion is you can write this code, shove it into the blockchain, and everybody gets to run it. Now, they say that uh, Bitcoin's little language is not Turing complete. To the mere mortals amongst us, that means it doesn't loop. Yeah, you don't have for loop. You don't have any looping mechanisms. You don't have any looping yeah. mechanisms. This is controversial, but I don't want to get into that. Um, Essentially, this means it's very limited. And the folks over at Ethereum turn around and say, you know, that's just not good enough. We're going to make a Turing complete language. No, no it was about dApps, damn it. It was about dApps, damn it. So, so I'm sorry, I, I don't fall in the Mike Hearn camp or the Stefan Thomas camp saying, wow, we can just come up with some really cool way, just somehow some way to create, uh, using the Bitcoin scripting language, an escrow contract or something like that. Not everybody has that programming proficiency. Here's why JavaScript was so damn successful. An everyday person could just write some JavaScript code and wow, it worked, it did something. And jQuery came around and wow, it worked, it did something. So the goal of Ethereum was saying, let's focus on developers who don't have PhDs in computer science, who aren't experts, who aren't expert programmers, and let's give them a really simple, easy set of tools that they can use to go ahead and write contracts that run, run on a blockchain. And then let's focus about composability. So instead of having somebody be able to figure out all these things, let's just have a library, right? And you can import those things. I think they're they, thank you for these mics, by the way, Paul. Charles, that's the mic should work. <laughs> <laughs> Not that could work. Oh, Louie. You're still going to buy me that kilt, right? <laughs> All right, so, so are, you just, are you just picking on Ethereum, or what is this about? Right, no, right. no. I get defensive the, about the, this. I'm sorry. Important, yeah. So, so right. Turing completeness and Turing machines are important in our world, not that we necessarily understand why, and we can argue about why. They are so important, or Turing is so important, that the ACM has a thing called the AM Turing Award. Yeah, the Turing Prize. The AM Turing Award is like the biggest award for computer science. So I spent this weekend and I applied for the AM Turing Award. Not for myself. I'm not allowed to do that. But for Satoshi Nakamoto. That took about three months worth of work it's now done, and that's one part of the little announcement. The other part of the little announcement. If, if Leslie Lamport won it, then Satoshi should win it. <laughs> no, it has to be nominated by somebody else. So there's, my, there's the proof, you see? Right. 
So Satoshi Nakamoto has now been nominated for the AM Turing Award, which is a bit, they say colloquially, the Americans say, it's like the, the Nobel Prize for computer science. Um, it's a big thing. But having thought about it for a long time, the innovation is actually worth it. It is pretty serious. Um, who knows whether we'll get through with this application. It might take several years. We might have to put it in again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other slightly small part of this um, is that I wrote an awful lot of stuff to get this sorted out. And not a lot of it made its way into the application. The application is something that's apparently confidential, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I have this content. So I will be putting some of this content onto coinscrum.com in the future days and weeks. So you'll be able to see all of this process. That's the second part. Picking on Ethereum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah we're, we're Ricardian contracts, not for smart contracts. Ricardian contracts are orthogonal to smart contracts. Yeah, right. okay. And I can't announce what we're doing with them. <laughs> Can I? I don't know, actually. Any other yeah, I just want to point out about Ethereum, though. Hang on, I just want to point out about Ethereum, though. The core innovation was not Turing completeness. I mean, this is, this is not something that... I know it came up a lot in the, the marketing, and I suspect that you, pretty, you know, probably enjoyed that. But the core innovation was just the idea about development experience. You know, a lot of the core developers of Ethereum came from Color Coins, they came from MasterCoin, they came from the altcoin community, and they came from these communities because they noticed, and they, they liked Ethereum because they noticed how incredibly difficult it was to do basic things. Okay, whether you wanted to do an escrow contract or whether you wanted to issue a custom currency, whatever it may be, you had to spend weeks or months engineering. And our goal was to try to create a very easy language. It looked like Python or JavaScript or something like that, where it would be rather straightforward and you would gain all the normal guarantees that you would get from uh, Bitcoin scripting. Um, there's some problems that come into this. The halting problem is one. Uh, and so you need to have metered computation. But if you do that, well, how do you properly price it? The other issue that comes into play is when you start running full programs on a blockchain, the issue is uh, scalability, right? So, and also mining validation. If they include more programs in the blockchain, it may become economically more efficient just to mine empty blocks than mine blocks that include transactions, okay? So these are some things that are still there. They come up, they're, and there are active areas of research and study, and there's projects like Hawk that are trying to find better ways of addressing it. But it's an open area of research. Now, as for Turing Completus, you know, I, I read his paper, but I, I got to tell you, it was a few years ago. And, you know, I'm a mathematician. I'm not a computer scientist. I don't think about these things regularly. Uh, and, you know, damn if I know. You know, I, I remember Ulam's machines and, you know, and so forth. But it's, it's just something I don't think about. And I don't think most computer scientists think about these things, to be fair and to be honest. No, they don't. Um, computer scientists do a bit of Turing completeness and so forth uh, in, in school, but they really don't get into it deeply until even grad school. And even then, no. <laughs> right, I mean, it's more about complexity, right? Is something a non-deterministic polynomial time or is it polynomial time, you know, and how do we do these proofs, NP complete? That's, that's a different, that's, that's more meaningful and probably more useful. The, the Turing side of things has, I think, mostly been resolved, uh, at least in my mind, in the mind of most people who work on these things. I'll have to accept that as an answer because okay. I never actually understood it at all. <laughs> <laughs> actually, if anybody does want to understand it, I suppose at a deeper level, and I should probably reread the book, uh, there is a wonderful book by Charles Petzold called uh, The Annotated Turing, and it talks about the history of the Enchidung's problem and also how s formal systems are built and it walks you through completeness and independence and consistency and eventually decidability, which is the problem that Alan Turing resolved. And it talks about how uh, Turing completeness works by annotating Alan Turing's paper. So they go through line by line and provide you some data and so forth. And I read it years ago and I, I barely understood it. It was fun. I'm not very bright. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you both of you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Ian. Thank you all for coming.